Okay. Let's get started. All right, so we'll continue where we left off again with some recap questions. I'm finishing up AA today and moving on to UV vis absorption chromatography. Um, oh my gosh, chromatography is always in my head. Absorption spectroscopy. All right, so what's the difference between AAS and AES? All right, Cheshun. Exactly. So Cheshun was saying that the atomic absorption spectroscopy, we are measuring the uh, absorption of light, whereas in AES, we're measuring the emission of light by atoms. And I just want to remind everybody, atoms in the gaseous state and neutral, not iron. All right, source of excitation. So this is a very common question that I would ask in a quiz on an exam. There is a source of uh, atomization and there is a source of excitation. So there are two different things. Atomization is the source that would break the molecular uh, bonds to release the atom and make it uh, make the atoms in the gaseous state. However, excitation is the source that would bring your atoms from ground state to excited state. So in atomic absorption spectroscopy versus inductively coupled plasma atomic emission spectroscopy, what is the source of excitation? Okay, so the light from the cathode lamp in AAS, correct. So in atomic absorption spectroscopy, uh, we have lamps and the lamps are the source of uh, light and the light is the source that excites your atom. And we have specific, we have spe specific cathodes in different lamps and the cathode is made up of the, um, metallic form of your elements. So it emits light in the spectra that is specific for these atoms. Okay, so that is correct for atomic absorption spectroscopy. What about inductively coupled plasma atomic emission? Yes, um, Dylan. The flame? Like so the, the flame is the source of atomization in atomic absorption spectroscopy. I know you want to say something else. What is the source of atomization and excitation? You have inductively coupled plasma. So your plasma is the source of excitation. So it's the high temperature plasma, which is the um, ionized form of gas. And the gas is argon in this state. And it is, uh, it is the source of atomization. So it breaks the molecule, molecular bonds. It gives the atoms, and it's also a source of excitation for these atoms. Okay. So in atomic absorption or atomic, atomic emission, what is the type of energy that is absorbed? Remember, we have different types of energy. Um, we talked about in the introduction to spectroscopy. We have electronic energy, we have vibrational energy, we have rotational energy. What type of energy is absorbed here? Electronic, vibrational, or rotational? Electronic, yes. So here we have atoms. We don't have vibration of bonds. There's no stretching or bending of bonds. And you don't have a molecule that is rotating around its uh, gravimetric center. So you have your atom and the electrons, the valence electrons, or the electrons in the outer shells are what get excited. So these electrons or the valence electrons get hit by the light and or the photon of light or photons of light that they absorb at a particular wavelength. And that is called electronic energy. 
So when I ask you about type of energy, I'm asking if it is electronic, if it's vibrational, and if it's rotational. And when you answer, I would want you to explain what is electronic energy. So these are common questions. Again, so when you study for the quiz or the midterm coming up, please remember these kind of questions. You might see them in the class. How do we get the minerals in solution? So you done, all of you, most of you, have done the atomic absorption laboratory already. And we talked briefly last time about your sample. So the sample is asked to remove all of, or to um, incinerate all of your organic matter. So what is left is the inorganic matter and your minerals is in that ash component. How do you bring it in solution? Common, common. You dissolve in acid. So you dissolve them in acid and then you dilute that acid. So they're now in solution. And when they're in solution, then you can measure them using the atomic absorption or atomic image. All right, so this is where this is where I stopped last time when we were talking about preparation of your sample and also preparation of standards, cleaning of glassware, sources of errors, and all of that. And we stop here with calibration. So when you determine a concentration using absorption or emission, you really need standards. So you need pure standards that you prepare them in a similar way or similar solution, similar acidic solution that you would prepare your, your sample in. And then you, what you need to do is you prepare your standards at different concentrations and you measure the absorptions of these standards and you plot the standard curve. So you have to select standards that are pure. 99% or higher pure, so you don't have contaminated. And also, you have to select the, the concentration that gives you optimum sensitivity and linearity. So you need to have linear range, which is when you want to do calculations, oftentimes you do linear regression. So we select the concentration where you get a linear um, line, so that you can have good prediction of your um, concentration. And then what you do is you dilute your samples in such a way that your um, concentration of your unknown lies within your standard curve, not above and not below. So that you don't, you're not outside of your calibration curve. Your prediction won't be accurate if you're outside that calibration. Pam, would you say that one more time for me? Yes. Of course, Chris. I was I, gonna, I was saying that when you prepare your samples, you dilute them in such a way that the concentration falls within the range of your standards. So, if let's say your standards are one ppm, two ppm, three, four, five ppm, or five, ten, twenty, forty ppm, depending on whatever the standard linear range is, you want to make sure your concentration of your samples. Uh, is within that range. So if you have a standard between 1 and 10 ppm, you want to make sure your sample lies within there, like 5, 6, 7 ppm, within that standard range. If your sample is too concentrated and it's, it's reading 20 ppm, that 20 ppm is not accurate because it thought your calculation fell outside of your linear uh, standard. So you want to make sure to go back, dilute your sample more, come back, measure, and make sure that it is within your standard range. Is that good, Stephen? Uh, Chris, sorry, do you want me to repeat that? Yes, thank you. Okay, good. The last thing I have here is interferences. So sometimes you have two elements that might absorb at the same or similar wavelengths. So you have, I think iron is somewhere 248 or something around that. And zinc is very close to it. So if you measure both of these in one sample and you're doing that with, let's say, um, not necessarily atomic absorption, maybe you need two different lamps for that, but if you're measuring it using ICT, ABS, you want to make sure you look at different wavelengths. Sometimes you might select not the optimum 
optimum wavelength, but when you have maximum absorption, you select a less optimum wavelength, but there's no interference between zinc and um, iron. So you won't have the same element absorbing at the same uh, wavelength. You, you just choose a different wavelength that zinc might not absorb. Um, background noise. Sometimes if you don't have complete atomization, and this happens when your flame is not really calibrated or set at a specific temperature where you get your atomization complete. Sometimes the flame could be cold flame. So your mole molecules are not, your molecular bonds are not breaking. So you have molecules in the flame that scatter the light. So less light will reach the detector. And if less light reaches the detector, you would be overestimating absorption. So it's very important that the flame temperature is controlled and you control that by the um, acetylene to air ratio. Transport interferences. So what do you have in your samples? What, what reagents you've used? And uh, how you prepare your standards. So I'm going to make sure that your standards are prepared in the most similar way that your samples are prepared. So your volatilization. Some of you that did the lab already, you add lanthanum chloride uh, when you're measuring calcium. Because calcium in the presence of phosphorus, which you might have phosphorus there, can form calcium pyrophosphate, which is a large molecule that will not really uh, get volatilized and, and won't reach the flame. So you would get underestimation of calcium. So you add lanthanum chloride in your solution as you're preparing your sample so that the lanthanum interacts with the phosphate and releases the calcium. So the calcium can be volatilized into the flame and can be measured. So if you don't put lanthanum chloride, you're underestimating your uh, calcium amount in, um, in your sample. Ionization. Again, this has to do with the flame and how much acetylene to uh, air ratio. So if you have re really hot flame, some of your, um, some of your atoms, I'm losing my words. Some of your atoms can ionize at when the flame is really hot. And if they ionize, they won't absorb in the same spectra. So you get underestimation of your um, atoms or of your elements. So again, the um, incomplete atomization or ionization they have has to do with your flame. You always want to make sure that your flame is well adjusted so that you get appropriate atomization with uh, no ionization. Lastly, here, if we want to compare atomic absorption spectroscopy to ICT, uh, atomic emission spectroscopy, they're both maybe trace elements. We have excellent precision and accuracy in both. However, the advantages of atomic absorption spectroscopy is that an older unit is well understood. There's a lot of research done using it. Um, there's wide availability of instruments and it's cheaper than ICT. However, advantages of ICT, you can measure multiple elements at the same time. You don't have, there's no lamps, you don't change lamps, you get simultaneous measurement of your samples and you do have high stability of your elements at high temperature. Detection limit, uh, ICP has much lower detection limit than AAS or atomic absorption spectroscopy. FYI, vapor 9.5 gives you the differences in um, sensitivity of detection or limits of detection for both units. Okay, with that, we're done with atomic absorption. I'm going to move on. So UV visible and fluorescence spectroscopy.
So UV vis spectroscopy, UV vis absorption, and fluorescence spectroscopy. So you can have absorption and you can also have fluorescence under this category. So this is check of knowledge, and I'm sure you might not remember this at all from in previous physics classes. But here we go. Molar extinction coefficient is a constant for all analytes. What I'm saying here is every analyte has the same molar extinction. A highly concentrated sample may result in deviation from Beer's law. What is Beer's law? We talked about it briefly last time. Does anybody remember what Beer's law is? Beer's law is the direct relationship between absorption of light and concentration. And we'll talk about it a little bit more here. See, incident beam minus exiting beam, that means the light hitting your sample minus the light exiting the sample or the transmitted light is equal to the light absorbed by the energy. So looking at this, do you have any suggestion to an answer? Okay. I see E a lot, which is a very common answer, but somebody just answered B. And B is the correct answer, the only correct answer. So every analyte has a different molar extinction. And we'll talk about molar extinction or in other words, absorptivity. So you either know it as absorptivity or molar extinction if the concentration is in molar concentration. Um, a highly concentrated sample, if a sample has highly concentrate, a high concentration of specific analytes, you have interference. Um, the analytes or the molecules are very close to each other and you get interferences and you get false absorption. So usually when we measure in absorption it has to be within a specific and dilute concentration. So you don't have really high interactions between molecules when you have high concentration. And incident beam minus exiting beam is not equal the light of short. There will be light that is reflected, there will be light that is scattered. So when the light hits your sample, some light gets reflected, some light gets scattered, and some light gets absorbed, and then some light gets transmitted. So incident beam minus transmitted beam is not equal absorption. All right. In both absorption and fluorescence spectroscopy, UV vis radiation is used. The transmitted beam is the signal measured. A grating monochromator is needed. Who's going to be grade and need it? Are these new? Nobody's going to give it a shot. Okay, so I'm seeing G. E. So let me tell you that B is not correct. Because in fluorescence, we're not measuring the transmitted beam. We are measuring the emitted light. So B is not correct. A is correct. We are utilizing UV and visible spectroscopy in absorption and fluorescence spectroscopy. And the grating monochromator is needed if we're quantitating. If we are not quantitating, if we're looking at spectra and for identification, we don't need a monochromator actually. So a monochromator is needed only if I ask in the question for quantitative for quantitative detection, you really need a singular wavelength. Uh, that, that way you obey Beer's law for quantification. 
If you don't have a singular wavelength, you do not obey Beer's law of money. All right, so in UV spectroscopy, we either measure absorption or measure fluorescence. We can do this for qualitative or quantitative needs. But we can also do this if your compound of interest is a chromophore, that's easy. So we can measure because it's a chromophore. It, it absorbs light and sometimes it emits light, so we can measure fluorescence. Sometimes your compound of interest is not a chromophore. That means it does not absorb light, like sugars, for example, carbohydrates in general. They don't absorb light. Can we make them absorb light? We can change them chemically to result in a component linearly that has a linear relationship with our analyte and can absorb light. So this, for example, would be uh, for quantification of macro components. This would be an example we're going to cover when we talk about the carbohydrates by phenyl sulfuric acid method. So we take the carbohydrate in the sample, we add acid to change their chemistry into furans, and then the furans react to the phenol, and then you get a compound that absorbs light in human cells. Quanti quantification of microcomponents, for example, we just did atomic absorption, that is quantification of microcomponents, which are your minerals. Also, you can do vitamins, for example, when we cover the vitamin chapters, we can talk about thiamine, which is measured using a fluorometric map. Enzyme linked in neuroassay, which is used mostly to measure allergens, so your proteins. So you, you link your uh, antigens or antibodies, you link them with an enzyme that converts a substrate into a product that gives you a product that is a chromophore and you measure the absorption of that. And we have a whole chapter on immune acids later on. So absorption, will, absorption and fluorescence will be um, with us for several chapters to come and utilization of this technique for several um, quantification or even looking at qualitative analysis. So we want to do quantitation. So for quantitation, we need to look at the light absorbed or the light emitted. But how do we do that? So what we do is we look at let's define certain elements that are very important for quantification first. So we have what is called P0, which is your incident beam or the incident light that is hitting your sample. You have your sample compartment, which is either a cuvette or, or a tube, a glass tube, where your sample is here and then the light travels through the sample holder, through the cuvette, and then you have your exiting light or the transmitted light. So in there, you have the concentration of your sample or analyte that is directly proportional to the absorbed light. So the higher the concentration, the more light that is going to be absorbed. And there's the A, which is the absorptivity, which is very specific to your analyte and the wavelength at which your analyte absorbs light. So you have here then the incident light, the exiting light or the transmitted light, C for concentration, A for absorptivity, B for the length of your cuvette. Okay? So, so these are all important for calculation or determining the concentration. So what we do, we correlate transmission or transmitted light to analyte concentration, or we correlate absorption to, to the concentration of the analyte. And what we do is the, lab, the latter, which is correlating the absorption to the concentration, because that's a linear relationship. And I'll explain why 
absorption has a linear relationship while transmission does not have a linear relationship. So transmission is basically the ratio of the exiting beam to the incident beam. Or we can say percent, percent transmission, which is also that ratio multiplied by it. It's, a non, it's not linear to concentration. Why? Because the incident beam minus the exiting beam is not equal absorption. However, if we look at absor absorbance, it is log PO over P, which is negative log transmission, okay? Because the transmission is P over PO. Here, absorption is log PO over P. So it's negative log P. It has a linear relationship with concentration. And that's where Beer's law is. So Beer's law, or actually Beer's Lambert law, two people, but for short, it's Beer's law. It's a relationship or the linear relationship between absorbance and concentration. So if I ask you to define Beer's law, simply you state it's the linear relationship between absorption and concentration. And it is designated as such with this equation. So absorption equals absorptivity, which is unique to the analyte. B is the length here in centimeter, and C is the concentration. And the concentration can be in molarity. So concentration can be in molarity, so in molar, millimolar, can be in milligram per milliliter, can be percentage, can be ppm, can be any of those concentration units. So B is the path length through the solution and it's in centimeter. And absorptivity, the units, comes from the units of C and B, basically. So when A equals this epsilon sign, it is molar absorptivity or molar extinction. So they mean the same thing. And if we say molar absorptivity or molar extinction, that means our concentration is in molar or millimolar. So after absorptivity is a proportionality constant. It's a constant, dependent on the molecular properties of the species, the wavelength, the chemical environment. Yes, all of the above. So it is, it is very unique to the molecular properties of the analyte of interest. It is specific based on the wavelength. So you change the wavelength, the absorptivity changes, and definitely the chemical environment, because depending on the pH, you might have certain ionization, you might have dissociation, association. So it will change. The pH, the ionic strength will impact your, even the temperature will impact your absorptivity. So in order to measure, well, to measure concentration, we have to accurately measure absorption. So like I said, PO minus P does not mean absorbed light, or it does not equal absorbed light. So you don't um, subtract and get absorption because some of the light is reflected you can see here, so the light goes in, some of it gets reflected here off of the surface of the govet or your sample compartment, or gets reflected here, some of the light. Some of the light gets scattered by particulate in, in your sample, okay? And some of the light will get absorbed. 
So how do we correct for reflection and the scattering of light is by having a blank or a solution that contains everything except your analyte. Then you can correct for that and get your actual absorption. So sometimes you have a, um, a unit that you only have one place to put your sample in. So you put your blank in and we do what we call zeroing. You zero the instrument. So you correct for everything except the analyte in your sample. And then take that blank out and you put your sample um, to that in and then you do the measurement. Sometimes you have a, a spectrophotometer where you have a reference cell where you can keep your blank in the instrument, in the reference cell, and you have your sample compartment where you put your sample in. So you're always measuring the reference and measuring the um, sample simultaneously, measuring your blank, measuring your sample simultaneously, and you get the corrected absorbance um, automatically. So it depends on the instrument that you have. So we need to obey Beer's law. So in order to obey Beer's law and not to deviate from Beer's law, we have to have certain concentrations. So your samples need to be dilute enough where there's no intermolecular interactions. Uh, when it's high concentration, you have distances decrease between molecules and then you have interaction, you have interference. So we have to have concentrations typically under 10 millimolar. We have to make sure that the environment is constant. You don't have a change in pH over time. So oftentimes you have a, a buffer. You're measuring in a presence of a buffer. You need to make sure that you don't have a certain um, ion interference. So making sure you don't have ionization happening or dissociation or association. So we make sure that our chemical environment is stable. Polychromatic light, if we have a polychromatic light, we have different absorptivity. We cannot measure using Beer's law. So we have to have a monochromatic light in order to uh, obey Beer's law. So if I ask you what are the three factors we need to consider to obey Beer's law, or what are the three factors that deviate us from Beer's law, here they are. Consideration, procedural consideration. So sample preparation. So when you're measuring absorption, your sample needs to be homogeneous and it shouldn't be cloudy. Clouding it causes scattering of light and overestimation, you get high absorption because you are overestimating what's in there because less light gets transmitted. So you need to have a homogeneous and a clear solution when you're measuring absorption and fluorescence. So we clarify, we make sure that our sample is homogeneous. Oftentimes we have the centrifuge prior to measuring absorption to remove any particulate that might interfere with our readings. So reference cells, appropriate controls, we're talking about blank, uh, that everything that is not present um, or is present in your sample, but is not the, the analyte itself. Chemical modification, correct for modifying reagents. So whatever we have, the, whatever we add to prepare our sample, any reagents that we add to prepare our sample or make our analytes convert them to chromophores. We need to add all of these reagents into our blank uh, solution to correct for any chemical modification. Sample holding cell. So the collects are very important. You don't want them to absorb light in the same region where your analyte is absorbing light. So if we want to measure in the UV, a range, you use quartz or fused silica. Uh, 
if we're measuring in the visible range, we use glass or plastic cheaper and disposable plastic covets. So we need to select the appropriate wavelength. And oftentimes, unless we have interfering analytes, often, oftentimes you select lambda mat, which is the wavelength at which you have the highest absorption, where you maximize sensitivity that way. Sometimes if you have interfering analytes, you don't want to measure, you have a couple of analytes that have similar lambda mats, you select another lambda where one of them absorb better than the other. So, but oftentimes you're selecting lambda mats for um, maximum sensitivity. If you have, so the bandwidth here, if you have a molecule or a compound that absorb light, let's say at 310, 311, 312, 313, 314, very similarly, they absorb light very similarly at these wavelengths. So you can increase the bandwidth. When you increase the bandwidth, you have higher light intensity. So you can enhance the threshold of detection. You can get more light power onto your sample. But if you do have a very sharp uh, bandwidth here, because your absorption changes dramatically between 310 and 313, you make, make sure that you only have a very small bandwidth to allow only that lambda max wavelength to pass through. Calibrating the instrument, oftentimes you want to make sure that the instrument recognizes zero transmittance, that means you block the light source and you calibrate saying this is no light is being transmitted at the moment, so zero transmittance. And then you unblock your light source and you have nothing in the cubet, in the sample holder and all the light that goes in reaches the detector. So that's 100% transmittance. In order to obey Beer's law, we need linear relationships. So we select the concentrations of our standards so that they, uh, they give you a linear line, linear regression. And every analyte has different linear, uh, linear range. So for example, you did the AA lab. So you have a different linear range for calcium than you have for iron. Or some, some of you still had to do that lab. But, but still, so every analyte has a different linear range, we will need to experimentally identify the concentrations where you can have a linear range. And you select these concentrations for your standards to construct your standard curve. So a nonlinear graph like that and the one at the bottom, you don't obey this law in this case. You cannot trust your data. You have inaccuracy in your data. The last thing here that is a little bit complicated um, is standard addition method, which is when you really have a very complex sample matrix, you cannot recreate in your standards. So a lot of interfering substances, uh, just a complex matrix for your sample that you cannot prepare your standard in the same way. So you build a standard curve within your sample matrix, and we call this standard addition. This is very common and it's actually used a lot because most of your sample matrices are complex, and it's very, very hard to have uh, standards prepared in the same way to get accurate results. So scientists found the solution. We can build the standard curve within our sample. So how do we do that? Okay, so I'm going to do some drawings here in the back. Okay, so what you have, you let's say usually you build a standard with five concentrations, four to five concentrations of your standards. So let's say I'm going to build uh, my standard curve with five standards, different concentrations. So I have here my Standard. So I have my standard, 
stock solution. So I prepared X standard stock solution, let's say 100 ppm or the standard stock solution. And then I have, I get three volumetric or five volumetric flasks that I'm going to prepare my standards in the sample, sample matrix. Five volumetric flasks. What I'm going to add to each one of them, the same volume of my unknown sample. Same volume, volume of unknown, VU. Same amount of volume in all of them. Now, this doesn't look like same amount of volume, but same amount of volume, VU, of my unknown. So U is for unknown. Same amount. And I'm going to take from my standard stock solution, different volumes in each class. Okay, so I will put, let's say, five milliliter here. Let's say I'm preparing a 100 ml solution. Put five milliliter here, 10, 15, 20, 25 milliliters of my stock solution, standard stock solution. That means I have different concentration of my standard in each of these flasks. So volume of S1, volume S2, volume S3, volume S4, volume S5. Okay, so different volumes in different in all of these flasks. So now I'm building my standard flow, right? Different concentration. And I make up all of them to this 100 milliliter mark. Okay, so the total volume is the same in each. So I have the same concentration of my unknown in each, and that's what I'm going to measure. The same concentration, I need to measure the concentration of my unknown, because I have the same volume. But I have built my standard that every flask has a different volume of my stock standard solution. And I measure absorption. And I plot my absorption, as you can see here. I plot my absorption over the volume in milliliters of my standard. And I get this equation here. My only unknown that I will solve is the concentration of the unknown because K is a constant, which is the proportionality constant of path length plus times absorptivity. Volume of the standard and concentration of the standard is known because I put similar amount and I have the concentration of my stock solution. I have the same total volume. And the only one that I don't know, I have the volume of the unknown, which I put, I know the volume of the unknown. The only thing that I don't know is the concentration of my unknown. And I can calculate for that. Okay. Any questions on that? Instrumental error or what we call it noise. So oftentimes you say there's instrument noise. There are little peaks and little absorptions of just noise from the instrument. So indiscriminate, indiscriminate error associated with absorption or absorbance transmittance measure. So basically, in other words, the noise of the instrument. It has to be small relative to the variation from sample prep, sampling, the agent handling, analyst, et cetera. This is telling you that the sample noise has to be, or the instrument noise have, has to be smaller than errors coming from all of these um, procedure. Your sample prep, the sampling, uh, the agent that you're using, or um, analyst, the analyst themselves, that means their technique, etc. It can be tested with repeated measurement of a single homogeneous sample. 
So you keep measuring the same sample multiple times, and then you can determine what the noise is by how the absorbance is changing every time you put the same sample in. Every time you put the same sample in, you might get slightly different reading. That is your noise. Can be reduced by the use of intermediate concentration. So we have a rule of thumb. We, we kind of say, okay, dilute your samples in a way that when you measure absorption, it falls between 0.2 to 0.8. That's kind of rule of thumb. If you have an absorption that reads two, Oh, this is too high, it's too concentrated, and you're going to get a lot of noise there. So you better dilute your sample to get better reading and lower noise as possible. So we say, okay, make sure your readings are between 0.2 and 0.8. So basically what I'm saying right now is all of the above, <laughs> A, B, and C. So I'm explaining that, that to you, but the answer is A, B, and C. Okay, so here's just the instrumentation, really quick. We've gone through monochromator before, but in a spectrophotometer or um, unit, what you have is your source of light, could be a tungsten light for visible, could be deuterium or UV. And it goes, the light goes through a monochromator so that you select a wavelength. Here's your monochromator where you have your the light going in, the pink one here. The light's going in, you have a mirror, it gets reflected into a grading system, gets diffracted into multiple uh, wavelengths, and you regulate it or select your slit in a way to allow a particular lambda to go through. And this gets to your sample. So it goes through the monochromator, you select your wavelength, one wavelength goes through your sample, analytes that absorb light at that wavelength absorb light, and then the transmitted light goes to the detector and the detector converts the light into electrical signal. We have phototube or photomultiplier tube detector. So in phototube, you have your beam which is your transmitted light at that point, hitting a cathode, and then it transmits an electron. The electron hits an anode, and it, here's your electrical signal, and that's what gets detected. The photomultiplier tube, tube enhances sensitivity, enhances detection, uh, because the, there's multiplication of the electrons. So what happens here, is your not the transmitted light hits your cathode electron is transmitted off into a dynode and then it gets multiplied every time it hits a dynode it gets multiplied until it gets to the final dynode and you have the signal multiplied many times so it enhances the signal the photo multiplier tube detector is the detector present in the atomic absorption instrument that we have for the atomic absorption lab. So that's the detector, and then you get the readout. Photodiode detector, we talked about that in the HPLC lab. We had a PDA, a photodiode array detector. So here's all the light hit the sample. There's no monochromator. So all the light hits the sample, and what happens is the sample absorbs, your analytes absorb light at different wavelengths, you get a spectrum. So all of the light that gets absorbed, and some gets reflected, and the transmitted light hits, we call it an array of photodiodes. So that means multiple photodiodes, an array of photodiodes. Each photodiode is going to convert a singular wavelength of light into an electron signal. So that's what we, why we see a spectra. We see an absorption over a range of, wave, of wavelengths. So that's the photodiode. Um, very briefly here, I know it's time, but I'll take two minutes and then we'll be done with this lecture here. 
here is just the instrument that I talked about earlier is you can have a reference cell at the same time being measured at the as the sample. So the source of light is broken into two. One goes to the reference cell, another goes to the sample cell. And from there, at the same time, we get absorption red from reference cell and sample cell and gets corrected at the end. The only problem with this is the radiant power diminished because the light is split into two. You get diminished radiant power, less threshold. The threshold will be uh, not as low as you would like it to. Um, with a single beam, sometimes you have to put the blank multiple times as you measure because over time you might get deviation. So you might to zero multiple times during your measurements if you have multiple samples you're measuring. This is just a FYI table that shows the absorptivity, lambda max of each analyte, different analytes, and then the absorptivity of the different analytes. Lastly, here is the fluorescence setup. When you have a spectrophotometer that you're measuring fluorescence, you have to remember you have to select the wavelength for absorption and a wavelength for measuring fluorescence. And measuring fluorescence will be at a longer wavelength because it's of a lower energy. Because when the molecule emits the light or wants to go from excited state to ground state, some of the energy is emitted as heat and the rest of the energy as light. That's why it's a longer wavelength. So you have to remember that. Okay, so what you have is you have your source of light. You or the monochromator here, the wavelength isolator, you get the selected wavelengths that you would measure at. You have the transmitted light, we don't measure that. We measure the emitted light. At the 90 degrees angle, there's emitted light at different wavelengths. So you select at which wavelength you want to measure emission. So that's why you have another wavelength isolator because you have multiple emitted light at multiple wavelengths. And, at, and then that wavelength that you want to measure emission at gets isolated, goes to the detector, and you get your readout. Okay? So in fluorescence, we're not measuring uh, transmitted light. We're measuring the fluorescent light or the emitted light. That's all you need to remember, and that is the end of that. Thank you for staying a couple of minutes longer. Yeah, let me just stop recording here real quick.